Welcome to the future and you. Ideas and opinion about the future based on verifiable facts of today. This episode is for April 24, 2013. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. This is the 300th episode of The Future and You. To celebrate this nice little milestone, I've asked the listeners and some of the past guests to send me fresh new predictions of the future which I can read into this episode. During the seven years in which I've been producing The Future and You, I've interviewed well over 300 people. During the last week or so, I've been sending out requests for predictions by email, through Facebook, and LinkedIn. I went to LinkedIn after Facebook complained that I was sending out too many messages to my friends. First, Facebook started annoying me by forcing me to type in jumbled up letters known as CAPTCHAs, then it simply locked up and wouldn't respond to my clicking on anything at all. Presumably, it thought I might be sending out spam. Although I've never heard of spammers sending out spam one at a time over a period of three hours. At any rate, this was annoying in that it meant that approximately one-fourth of the authors and futurists I had intended to contact could not be contacted. On the bright side, I did receive many wonderful and curious predictions. My apologies if you did not receive a request. By the way, if you enjoy the smorgasbord of predictions in this episode, you may also enjoy the 200th episode, dated May 25, 2011, which also contains a large number of predictions from listeners and past guests. I'll include a link to it in the show's blog post, which is located at thefutureandyou.libsyn.com. Libsyn is spelled L-I-B-S-Y-N. And as always, you can learn more about many of the people in today's episode using the links I've placed in the show's blog post. Since so many people sent me predictions, I will limit the amount of biographical introduction for each person to a bare minimum, just enough to give you a sense of what they are about and I will read the predictions mostly in the order in which I received them. And now, let us begin. Jack McDevitt, best-selling author and former guest on The Future and You. Dear Stephen, my prediction. Technology will soon allow us to replace actors with virtuals. That means we can replace Bogart with ourselves. I would get to play Rick, or a more likely role in a different film, Inspector Clouseau or I might leap tall buildings as Superman. Paul Parsons, writer, editor, and journalist at Wired Magazine and New Scientist. Thanks, Stephen. Personally, I'm looking forward to the rise of quantum information. During the early 20th century, physicists realized the importance of quantum laws for the behavior of matter. These laws had some weird consequences, for example, allowing particles to be in different states at the same time. Now it's being realized that information, by virtue of the fact that it must ultimately be stored on physical media, and so must obey the same laws as the physical world, must itself be inherently quantum. Whereas quantum physics means that a particle can be in different states at the same time, quantum information theory means that a classical bit of information, a binary digit, which can be either one or zero, can now be both one and zero simultaneously. Computers are now being built that calculate using these quantum bits or qubits. Whereas an ordinary classical computer, like the ones we all have on our desks, process bits one at a time, a quantum computer can exploit the fact that qubits can hold many bits simultaneously, enabling them to process many bits simultaneously. This means that a quantum computer of the sort now being built in labs around the world will be dramatically faster and more powerful than any computers we have today, able to tackle numerical problems that would literally take existing computers longer than the age of the universe to complete. Quantum information theory is also being used to devise encryption systems that are absolutely secure. Perhaps most intriguingly, even internet gaming would change quite radically when players acquire the hardware to exchange quantum information and the know-how to exploit it. The optimal strategy in a game is currently dictated by game theory, which itself is based on the classical theory of information. Plug in the quantum theory of information instead, and suddenly the optimum strategies change. This applies to games like online poker, but also to that biggest game of them all, the stock market. 
it seems it may be those gamers who play by the mysterious rules of the quantum world that win the biggest prizes. Congrats on your 300th podcast. Hope it goes well. Cheers. And that was from Paul Parsons. Mike Resnick, best-selling author and former guest on the show. By 2020, private entrepreneurs will be selling orbital flights. By 2025, private enterprise will build a small moon colony. By 2030, the mass market paperback will no longer exist. By 2035, the retirement age for Social Security and Medicare will be 75. By 2040, the Cincinnati Bengals will finally win a Super Bowl. Nancy Kress, best-selling author and former guest on the show. Prediction. There will be bad water disputes over the fresh water in the Great Lakes. Although starting as political fights, they will turn violent. David Brin, best-selling author and former guest. Stephen, congratulations. Here is a prediction. The recent revelation of a million documents from secret banking havens is only the beginning of a long process that will inevitably end in either a closed world run by elites or an open, transparent one. Yes, I am putting it in dramatic, even Manichean terms, but I've suggested this coming crisis in both fiction, my novel Earth, 1989, and in nonfiction, The Transparent Society, published in 1997. Let me take it farther. This movement may be propelled soon by one or more radicalized nations in the developing world. Not radicalized by socialism or religion or dogmatic frenzy, but by the appearance of a new class of honest, grown-up leaders at their helms. Imagine the fury that those leaders and their people will feel when they suddenly realize just how much of their national wealth was siphoned away by their own former kleptocrat lords. Vast amounts that those thieves took with them into exile. For example, the Philippine Presidential Commission on Good Government is probing into the disclosure that Maria Imelda Marcos Manatoc, the eldest daughter of the late dictator Ferdinand Marcos, was a beneficiary of a secret offshore trust of prodigious proportions in the British Virgin Islands. Now extrapolate this and you start to understand why the Swiss bankers and others have seemed so eager and willing to strike semi-transparency deals with tax authorities in Europe and North America. Because those big countries have clout and because the real business of lucrative banking secrecy lies in that mountain of klepto hordes looted from much poorer nations. Will this lead to the Helvidian War I described in my book Earth between developing nations and Switzerland? I was being dramatic, but stay tuned. Kim Stanley Robinson, best-selling author and former guest. In 50 years, sea level will be 10 centimeters higher and people on coastlines will be getting very serious about climate change issues. Joe Haldeman, best-selling author and former guest. His prediction. A routine rover survey of the moon will discover an ancient civilization that existed a few meters below the surface millions of years ago. Most people will think it's a hoax. Larry Niven, best-selling author and former guest. If you pass a law against hiring people, you will get unemployment. Larry Niven lives in California and may re be referring to some important trends that are going on, on out there, of which I'm not aware. Kathy Smith, insect geneticist and former guest. Increased harnessing of genetically modified bacteria to mass produce needed pharmaceuticals, like what they do now with insulin. Terry Grossman, MD, president and co-CEO of Ray and Terry's Longevity Products. Uh, by the way, the Ray portion of the name Ray and Terry's is none other than Ray Kurzweil, the legendary futurist and a personal hero of mine. Dr. Grossman wrote, Hi Stephen, computer-generated diagnoses. Allopathic medical doctors, MDs, can be roughly divided into two broad groups, physicians and surgeons. My son will begin medical school in a few months, and although I am a physician myself and do little surgery, I have strongly encouraged him to enter a surgical specialty. 
my reasoning is that I feel the future for non-surgical physicians will be threatened by computer-based diagnostic programs and that this will occur within the next few years. Watson, the supercomputer developed by IBM and WellPoint, is able to scan 200 million pages of the medical literature in less than three seconds to help diagnose illness and provide treatment recommendations. It has been over two years since Watson decimated its two human opponents, the best contestants to ever play on Jeopardy. Similarly, I feel it will be very difficult for human physicians to compete with Watson in diagnosing patients. I envision a scenario in the very near future where patients interact with an allied health professional such as a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant to help elicit the medical history and perform a physical examination while the actual diagnosis will be computer generated. Michael Z. Williamson, author and editor at large of survivalblog.com and a former guest. Nuclear power is the way of the future and it's arriving quickly. Michael H. Hansen, author and former guest. RFID chips implanted in every pet, soldier, child, and finally citizen adult. Every chip will have complete medical and ID records and can be used as e-keys for car and home doors and also used as credit cards. Michael Z. Williamson responded to that one with, every citizen adult except one. Michael Z. Williamson is a staunch privacy advocate, and so I feel certain he is referring to himself as the final holdout. Brian Wang, futurist, essayist, and blogger about the future at nextbigfuture.com, and a former guest on the show. Predictions from Brian Wang. 2012 to 2033, manned landing on Mars and permanent base by 2023 to 2037. A 2,000 meter building will be made by 2028. A structure with a height of over 10 kilometers by 2038. Technically possible for the building, but the economics may not be there for a building over 10 kilometers. A human being has lived to over 150 years of age by 2113. This would be someone who is 50 years old now. Before 2073, a molecular nanotechnology enhanced SENS damage repair methodology will be produced to enable radical rejuvenation. There is a reasonable chance, 50-50, of regular SENS, synthetic biology, or some form of stem cell rejuvenation adding enough life extension starting around 2030 to help get someone who is 70 to better life extension. This would mean boosting the life expectancy of a young person by 40 years and someone who is 70 by 10 years. Those forms of life extension might or might not add the years needed to get to 150 for someone who is 70 years old now. If these were successful, then it would be that a human being has lived to over 150 years by the year 2093. This is because extending the life of someone who is already old is a far tougher thing. There's a 50-50 chance that there should be molecular nanotechnology with nanofactories by 2040, with Fritas-like nanomedicine by 2045. Medical tourism may be needed to get to a place where nanomedicine is approved in a timely fashion. Data-driven eugenics for selecting for intelligence will happen with the screening of embryos in China by 2019. Selection based on genetic makeup will occur by 2023 for pre-implantation and by 2030 for selection of the egg or sperm via non-destructive methods and genetic modification of cells and embryos. Embryos created with assisted reproductive techniques can already have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and genetic profiling is becoming more advanced. The genes that have a positive or negative effect on intelligence will be announced in two months. 750 genes that have an effect on height are already known. Kania Sunsu, digital person, transhumanist, life extensionist, social critic, essayist, author, public speaker, radical gadfly, and futurism activist. Hi, Ewan. She's referring to me by my middle name. I shall repeat one prediction I made before, and I'll go on the record here. 
After 2010, and probably it'll turn out ever since 2000, unemployment has gone up considerably faster than before. Around this point, we have reached the upward arc of a hockey stick incline curve where unemployment will go up faster and faster, and it will never come down as long as we inhabit the current, arguably pathological, economic system generally labeled capitalism. Due to technological advances in automation and robotization, at some point in the future, unemployment will go up well beyond anything we have seen in human history. My prediction is somewhat problematic in one regard. The entire economic system we are in will insist it isn't true, or it will blame the victims of this process. But my prediction is, every year, irreversible unemployment will go up between 1 and 2 percent every year. In essence, that means that somewhere around 2050, we will either see a collapse in the definition of what it means to be employed, or we will see an end to democracy and unemployment well over 50 percent, sometime before the middle of this century. My subsidiary prediction is that this will either result in massive societal unrest and disruption, and or a worldwide end to freedom, and or the implementation of a tyrannical system, and or the implementation of a universal basic income in most developed countries, probably two out of three. The problem is falsifiability with that prediction. Half the world will be in denial for a long time about it. Tom Kratman, author, soldier, lawyer, and retired lieutenant colonel from the U.S. Army. Uh, by the way, Tom's prediction will make more sense if you are familiar with the phrase amoral familism. It was invented by a political scientist named Edward C. Banfield for his 1955 book, The Moral Basis of a Backward Society, in which he studied a town in southern Italy which was completely dysfunctional. He described the town as a self-interested, family-centric society which sacrificed the public good for the sake of nepotism and the immediate family. Their complete refusal to work together for community goals made their town a terrible place to live. Tom's prediction is, Continuing progress in the breakdown of civilization and or of the consensus for civilization and the increase in amoral familism pretty much across the globe. This will be driven in part by continuing attempts to throw up supranationals like the European Union, for which few of its citizens have any emotional attachment, and the concomitant undermining of nation-states for which their citizens do have an emotional attachment. Dr. Aubrey de Grey, life extension researcher, activist, public speaker, and fundraiser and former guest on the show. Hi, Steve. Okay, I predict that the long-standing trend for life expectancy in the developed world to rise about two years per decade will level off in the next two decades with very little additional rise, but that after that we will see a sharp acceleration such that life expectancy will become impossible to calculate in the way it is usually done these days. This is because the advances that have driven increased longevity in recent decades will reach diminishing returns, just as those which reduce infant mortality a century ago had reached diminishing returns by mid-century. And the next wave of longevity-enhancing advances will probably not arrive until 2035 or so. Cheers, Aubrey. Michael Vassar, futurist, life extensionist, singularitarian, transhumanist, co-founder and chief science officer of MetaMed Research, and former guest. He was president of the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence until January of 2012. His prediction, in the 2030s, the cost of the power consumed by electronics will far exceed the cost of the electronics themselves. Most computation will be on the cloud in temporarily rented local servers, while individuals will interface with the cloud via user interfaces managed by sub-petaflop computing networks distributed on their person. Extropia da Silva, futurist, essayist, transhumanist, public speaker, digital person, and former guest on the show. In her prediction, Extropia mentions Oculus Rift. Oculus Rift is a virtual reality display which resembles goggles. A virtual reality display is different from an augmented reality display in that it completely obscures the wearer's field of vision in order to immerse the wearer in a reality which is completely artificial. 
such as the world inside a high-end video game. Extropria's prediction is, virtual reality, like we imagined it to be, will truly begin with the commercial availability of the Oculus Rift. This will usher in a genre of interactive experiences in which the aim is simply to explore environments that show off the artistic talents of graphic artists. Such people already craft gorgeous environments and architecture of games, like Halo, but the combative nature of the gameplay makes it hard to stop and appreciate their efforts. Future games will be far more passive and tranquil, perhaps encouraging cooperation by including areas that can only be explored via teamwork. Dave Freer, author, ichthyologist, and former guest on the show. One, <laughs> he opens by responding to my request for one prediction, uh, one brief, in fact, prediction. One, one, you're a spoil sport, Cobb. Every 20 or 30 years or so, it seems two or three things shift the world, and often we don't notice because it becomes so much part of our world. For example, the early 1900s was the era when high-pressure chemistry changed everything. I bet you have no idea what in your life draws directly from this. Answer, everything, from your food to your light bulb. We're aware of the changes in computing as the latest one, and already it is so integrated that we take it for granted. For my guess at the next, one that's been slowly developing under the radar, materials and energy storage science will change almost everything you assume is normal about your world, from buildings to bicycles and about the way its economy works. To the human from 2070, 2013 will look like the year 1500 does to us. Materials will shift from metals with startling rapidity to carbon-based or even possibly silicon probably increasingly manufactured by genetically tailored bacteria. The strength and ductility of these materials has vast implications for what you can build and what happens to those places that live by selling iron ore. From there, it's a short step to growing your own house, car, or gun. When it comes down to energy, that picture will change beyond your imaginings. We'll probably use much more, but as battery capacity, 3D electrodes are already in the pipeline at the desktop level, increases by an order of magnitude, and we then move to synthetic photosynthesis. The power lines and gas stations will become historical relics. The rich will be the patent holders. As for the effects this will have on humans, it's far from pretty. The effect on states, which have, say, oil or iron ore as principal revenue earners, and the hundreds of millions of people who simply lack training, intellect, capacity to adapt to the need for a class of jobs vanishing, will be vast. Social unrest and major changes in world power, no, I, actually I wasn't being nasty about the U.S., Russia, Australia, and Brazil were in my mind first off, protests, civil wars, wars to maintain the status quo against the tide, and historically regressive Islamic theocracy, as well as some new, to those who don't do history, socio-political experiments will happen. Barry Hayworth, a long-time listener from Australia, Steve, you're really up to the 300th episode already? Doesn't seem long enough since the 200th. As for trends, the trend I'm most interested in at present is the rapid privatization, democratization of space travel. SpaceX were already getting started two years ago, and since your 200th episode, they have successfully taken on space station resupply and are working toward their manned capsule, the first ever fully private manned space vehicle and a fully reusable launch system, which will have an enormous impact if they can get it to work. Nor are they alone. NASA are supporting one other space station resupply, the Orbital Sciences Cygnus vehicle. Cygnus spelling, being spelled C-Y-G-N-U-S. Away from LEO, low Earth orbit, and the space station, we have seen two companies announce private efforts to mine asteroids, Deep Space Industries and Planetary Resources. One, Golden Spike, who are offering private expeditions to land people on the moon, and two different plans to get people to Mars. Dennis Tito's Inspiration Mars plan to send a manned capsule on a Mars flyby by 2018, and the Mars One effort, which plans to send people to Mars one way as the ultimate reality TV adventure. How many of these, if any, will succeed is anyone's guess at this point. 
but it is very pleasing to see the state of art progress to where so many proposals are on the table. Rudy Hoffman, certified, pl certified financial planner, futurist, life extensionist, and the world's foremost cryonics insurance provider. He doesn't just sell cryonics insurance, he's signed up to be cryonically preserved himself. And he's a former guest on the show. Hi, Stephen. Congratulations on your 300th episode. Wow. In the not-too-distant future, probably 2025 to 2035, cryonic suspension and resuscitation will be considered mainstream medicine. People will receive organ transplants from frozen organ banks, as well as grown from their own DNA. Much progress will have been made in what enables human thriving in every arena. This would include financial, emotional, physical, and our sense of purpose and bliss. We will be able to tweak our moods with legal drugs and nutraceuticals, experiencing various shades of joy and bliss much of the time. This is a future you want to be a part of, which is why checking out cryonics makes sense for rational people. Warm regards for another 300 plus shows. Rudy. Charlie Cam, futurist, transhumanist, singularitarian, cryonicist, and singer-songwriter. He wrote and performed the parody song on YouTube I am the very model of a singularitarian, which is sung to the tune of I am the very model of a modern major general, which is from the Gilbert and Sullivan opera Pirates of Penzance. Hi, Steve. Okay, here's a prediction of ironic proportions. Our vanity will eliminate our superficiality. Stem cell therapies will soon become the big wave of the cosmetic enhancement for skin and hair. It will replace facelifts, Botox, laser, and all topical treatments. The number of users will be exponentially bigger than all of those aforementioned therapies combined, because it will be curative rather than the temporary fix that the others offer. Wrinkles and baldness will be gone, which means everyone at all ages will look equally very young, thus given that everyone will be youthfully physically appealing, Attractiveness in society will be more determined by personality and intelligence than outward appearance. Sarah A. Hoyt, award-winning author and former guest on the show. We are about to enter a period of high social turbulence. How high the turbulence and how bad it will get, I can't tell. But it is driven by extreme technological change, which is unmooring old social contracts, creating new ones, and bringing up a generation that can't quite understand the past because their present is so different. It is a truism to say that after the singularity there is a future we don't understand. What anyone fails to get is the steps in between and that future people also won't understand the past. I'm not saying that we're in the midst of the singularity exactly, certainly not as transhumanists see it, with brain enhancement and highly expanded lifespans, Though that might come sometime in the future, I don't think it's in the next 50 years or so. What I think is that there are many mini-singularities, each of which changes things dramatically compared to what they were before. The last one was the Industrial Revolution, which even in its very beginnings spawned such things as the French Revolution. The old bonds of aristocratic society no longer fit society as it had become. We are in the middle of one of those now brought about by the information revolution, and soon things such as industrial 3D printing. Publishing is being hit with this right now, as are the news business and, to a lesser degree, but it's already clearly next on the slate, education. After that it will be the media. Podcasts like this one already compete well with radio, but TV and the cinema will undergo the same every man a movie maker revolution that books are undergoing with every writer a publisher. This will bring about turbulence, both legal and economic, and assuredly personal. I believe, though, when things calm down, I hope in about 20 years, because I would like to see it, we'll be in a world with greater personal freedom, where you can choose to live where you want and work where you want, and have greater opportunities for creativity and learning, a level of freedom that has, in fact, never existed for the human race before. In the meantime, well, things will get ugly. From what I hear from my country of origin, uh, she's from Portugal in, in Europe, though she's lived in America for decades, they're already getting ugly. How ugly? 
I'm hoping we avoid the level of sheer bloodshed of the French Revolution, simply because the world doesn't have, in proportion, a surplus of young people it can sacrifice to warfare. But that is a prediction for another time. In fact, how that lack can or would be remedied forms the basis for my Dark Ship Space Opera series and its twin series, The Earth Revolution. Daniel M. Hoyt, author, IT professional, and former guest on the show. Thanks for thinking of me, Steve, and congratulations on the 300th episode. My prediction for the future is that the concept of jobs and career will change drastically. In some ways, it already has. In the 1950s, it was common to have a lifelong career at a single company. My grandfather, for instance, retired from a 56-year job where he started in the mailroom and ended as the director of finance. Even in the 1980s, when I started my career, it was considered a black mark if you didn't stay at a job for at least a year or two before moving on. Now, thanks to layoffs or downsizing or right-sizing, however you want to spin it, it's still unemployment, every couple of years a job market that's geared toward networking and personal references instead of qualifications and the loss of the trust between employers and employees that used to be so pervasive, those stigmas are pretty much gone. The concept of a career has already changed so much that it's considered normal these days to abandon a job for which you studied and or were trained and try something entirely new, sometimes even something for which there was no training available when you entered the workforce. With the demonization of businesses and new anti-business policies now in place, employers are already finding that the best way for them to survive is to cut official hours below the arbitrary thresholds that would incur stiff penalties while still requiring workers to do the same amount of work they were doing. While the young wage earners are usually willing to work unpaid hours, older workers may not be. They're likely to drop out of the workforce entirely and start new businesses that are small enough to avoid those same penalties that drove them out of the traditional workforce. Eventually, this leads to a culture of micro-jobs, where workers hold several entrepreneurial or contract jobs, all of which fly under the government radar, some of which may exist globally instead of regionally, and the workforce itself becomes a more fluid entity, more resistant to dependence on individual contributors. Single job workers would be viewed as oddities, and the concept of a career makes no sense under this structure. You either work or become a societal parasite. Jeremiah Bylas, Futurist and Educator Collective intelligence will lead to collective consciousness. The Internet will wake up when infused intimately enough with human intelligent interactions, social media, and it will be a rebirth of ourselves as one. This will happen once augmented reality matures. To be so intimately connected, the experience will be mystical, noetic. Just as quantum mechanics, the psychedelic revolution, and astronauts like Edgar Mitchell all know, all is one. Siddhartha S. Verma, a college student in Australia. The future is going to be very different from the past. Physicists claim that one cannot differentiate between the past and future arrow of time. But in reality, when making observations about any stage of development at any instant in the history of evolution of this universe or our planet Earth, one can clearly see the difference and changes happening, be it on the evolution of stars, supernova, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, etc. These phenomena can be explained only to an extent the theories are still incomplete. Our planet Earth, for example, its evolution in the past four billion years can be said to be irreversible and the same can be said about the time in posterity yet to come. Any advanced civilization of the future will have technologies, cultures, values, ethics, and rules quite different from those of today or of the past. Many factors will contribute to this, such as changes in their thinking, needs, and necessities. There could be a number of parameters which will exist, change, or cease to exist in the future. Parameters which will cease to exist in the future might include many species of plants and animals which are close to extinction, if measures are not taken to preserve them, a proper balance in Earth's atmosphere, if precautionary measures are not taken in time, or even the planet Earth itself, 
if it is unable to cross the existential risks which will be upon it in close futures such as 30 to 40 years of time. Parameters which will change will likely include things people use every day, both rich and poor, i.e. clothes, cars, houses, food, medicine, media, both music and video, as well as many other technologies in aviation, defense, space exploration, agriculture, longevity research, renewable and non-renewable sources of energy, handheld touch screens, wearable devices, geoinformatics, computers, cloud computing, bioinformatics and biomedical technologies, energy storage mediums such as new forms of lithium-ion batteries and solar cells, and other things. Elaborating on a few examples like clothes, cars, medicines, and food, clothing can take different forms in the future, which can have all sorts of electronic circuitry embedded in it, and which can be designed to suit multiple fashion trends as well as weather and seasons. There can also be clothes which are self-repairing or which are more resistant to wear and tear. Amongst cars, new designs will be lighter, give more mileage, use different forms of fuel and ignition. New paint technologies will allow cars to resist scratches and even change color. More built-in digital and electronic technologies will make them more entertaining for the passengers and user-friendly for the driver, or even driverless, as is being developed presently by pioneer researchers like Sebastian Thrun and companies like Google. As to medicines, one area of benefit is the growing field of nanotechnology, which can modify cells and molecules in the human body to perform specific tasks, such as using nanorobots in blood and cells. And one can expect increases in life expectancy of human beings. This field is already under close investigation by the eminent researcher Aubrey de Grey, founder of SENS, S-E-N-S. -S. Concerning food, its forms and nutritional values will change to suit the lifestyle of future cultures. There is already a huge difference between the types of foods eaten in the East and West. An even wider difference may develop between the people of the present and the future. Nutrients may someday come in compact size, capsule-like tablets, which are already somewhat used by astronauts who go into space. Technologies which will exist in the future, which one cannot find today, include brain simulation, a matter of investigation by companies like Carbon Copies, run by Dr. Randall Cohn, K-O-E-N-E. -E. Space colonies on Mars or different planets or solar systems. Strong artificial intelligence. Geostationary, geosynchronous space colonies. Faster means of space travel. Floating cities. More companies like Facebook and Google on different platforms. Robots to cater to society for various purposes. Nanotechnologies not currently present and changes to human morals, ethics, and values. Other than these, there are many unknowns beyond the perception of human imagination concerning how the future will change as a product of evolving and emerging interdisciplinary technologies. Cheers and thanks. Siddhartha. Larry Bowman, a listener. My guess is that within five years, China will make its move militarily in the East due to the tensions between them and Japan. China's male-to-female ratio will be the tipping point. Andrew Alexander Wallace, a listener. I would see troubled times ahead with economic stagnation and possible collapse toward the end of this century. Not good for us all, and certainly not good if we want a high-tech civilization of any kind. However, down at the grassroots level, I see people working on all kinds of solutions that could lay the foundation for a future sustainable high-tech type 1 civilization. People have started sowing the seeds for the future. Uh, when he says type 1 civilization, Andrew is referring to the Kardashev scale, which is a method of measuring a civilization's level of technological advancement based on the amount of energy the civilization is able to utilize. At type 1, which is the one he mentioned, the lowest level, a civilization uses an amount of energy equal to all that falls on its planet in the form of sunlight either by actually capturing that sunlight or by making an equivalent amount of energy by other means. In Type 2, a civilization would capture all the energy emitted from its star, in our case the sun, and in Type 3, it would capture all the energy emitted by all the stars within its galaxy. Bob Hooker, IT professional and former guest on the show. 
Some things I am looking at closely. 1. The emergence of a currency that is not issued by a state, not tied to a commodity like gold, and is available globally and commonly used. I don't think it would be the Bitcoin, but the Bitcoin is the idea. 2. China is facing a demographic time bomb as the full impact of the one-child policy means an older, more male population that starts to become less productive. As China's growth is driving much of the global economy, this is going to likely be the most significant near-term event as the cost of supporting an older population hits China. A potential period of low growth, like Japan, would have major global impacts on the world economy, especially for nations like Australia, Canada, Brazil, Russia, and India, who are growing in large part by supplying China. 3. Connect like devices will turn any surface into an interface to the Internet. This will mean that the Internet will become an ever-present part of our culture, like language or fashion, which had to be invented but now constitute the symbolic framework in which we think. That is, they don't exist, they make existence possible. In the very near future, the Internet will just be part of the world. We will think of the Internet not as a technology, but simply take it for granted, like writing. And four, people will forget how to write with pens. I already see this happening. The next prediction is from James, a listener. Congratulations on 300 episodes. I love the show and I'm glad to see it hit such a milestone. My prediction. I predict by 2040 there will be humanoid robots commercially available that can emulate the majority of interactions a person can have with a friend or lover using advanced bodies and AI so well that they will surpass normal human relationships in many ways. And our final prediction comes from David Orban, futurist, essayist, entrepreneur, public speaker, and former guest. The social structure we call nation-state is close to running its course, to be replaced by two alternatives simultaneously existing, supranational entities gaining more and more power on one hand and peer-to-peer -peer local organizations on the other. Nation-states have been born to centrally organize the fulfillment of the needs of their citizens in the areas of identity, defense, manufacturing and distribution of energy, food and industrial products, and education and health. Supranational organizations like the European Union, current crises notwithstanding, are creating the framework of policymaking which can stand up to the power of the multinational corporation. Identity and defense, not to be seen in military terms, but in the regulations defining how advances in information technology, chemical and biological technology, can dynamically coexist with our evolving understanding of privacy, social health, and humanity. New ways of energy production, mainly solar, as well as hydroponic self-enclosed plant labs for food, 3D printed meat and consumer and industrial products, are all pointing towards a distributed network organization without a center. The quantified self movement in health and massive online open courses in self-directed learning complete the picture. The network society, replacing the nation state, is going to be more diverse, more resilient, and with higher degrees of freedom and opportunity for all, and is coming rapidly with the new replacing the old. And there you have it. That's all the predictions. And what a variety they are. Thank you to all who participated. Great stuff. If you missed getting your prediction in, well, with a little luck, in two years, I hope to be doing another special show for the 400th episode. In the meantime, if you send me a prediction before then, I'll just read it into one of the regular weekly episodes. By the way, if you found some of these people's ideas interesting and want to hear more from them, keep in mind that all past episodes of this show remain available for your downloading enjoyment. And many of these people have been guests on the show, some of them, several times. If you'd like to learn more about me, you can go to my website, stevecobb.com. That's spelled S-T-E-V-E-C-O-B-B dot com. Or search for my full name, Stephen Ewan Cobb, which is spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N-E-U-I-N-C-O-B-B. -E -E if you enjoyed this show, please share it with all of your friends. Thank you for listening.
That's it for this episode of The Future and You. This program is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 2.5 license. A copy of this license may be viewed at creativecommons.org. Briefly, this means you may, indeed you are encouraged to, copy this entire program as many times as you wish and give it away to as many people as you wish. But you may not copy only a portion of this program, you may not charge anyone any amount of money for it, and you may not use any portion of it to make something new. On the other hand, anyone whose obvious goal is to recommend the show to others automatically gets special dispensation. Offline reviews, which include the show's website, may include brief quotes. And online reviews, such as for a blog or community group or web page, which provide a conspicuous link to the show's website, may use as many quotes as they wish, up to and including a transcript of one half of any interview. The show's theme music is a blues number called Some Sympathy by Chris Jurgensen, and is from his album Big Bad Son, which is available at magnatune.com. Magnatune is an independent record label that sells its catalog of music through online downloads and print-on-demand CDs. The company allows artists to retain full rights to their music and splits equally with an artist all the revenue from the sale of their work. All the music at Magnatune may be previewed free of charge and customers can even choose how much they want to pay for the music with pricing ranging from $5 to $18 per album. You can learn more about them at magnatune.com that's spelled M-A-G-N-A-T-U-N-E dot com. If you have a theory or opinion about what the future will contain, be it the near future or the far future, you may email it to me at thefutureandyou.com. That's M-E at symbol thefutureandyou.com. You may also suggest topics that you would like to hear discussed or send contact information for experts that you feel might provide valuable insights into the future. Mind you, an expert is not necessarily someone with an impressive degree. The best experts are the people who live or work or strive in the area under discussion. If the subject is science or medicine or academia, a degree is important. But if the discussion concerns trends in construction or firefighting or video gaming, a degree is pretty much meaningless. To get the inside dope, you've got to find the people who actually do this stuff every day. They are the first to see the trends because the trends have already begun changing their lives. As to the topics we will explore in the next episode of The Future and You, I can make no guarantees. Interviews are still being sought, recorded, and edited. All I can promise is that we will ruminate on the future. To learn more, check the show's website at thefutureandyou.com. If you enjoyed the program, please mention it to a friend, and be sure to join me again next time. Until then, I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. On behalf of myself and all my guests, I thank you for listening.